this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. When we think of airborne operations in World War II, the historiography is dominated by operations in the European theatre. Parachute drops on Sicily, the Normandy coast for D-Day and the Netherlands for Operation Market Garden. But in the Pacific, Joseph Swing's 11th Airborne Division, nicknamed the Angels, were making combat drops too. They fought in some of the most dramatic campaigns, from bloody skirmishes in Leyte's unforgiving rainforests to the ferocious battles on Luzon, including the hellish urban combat of Manila. Joining me is James Fenlon. Long-time listeners might remember I chatted with James about the US 17th Airborne Division during Operation Varsity, the crossing of the Rhine. This time we're discussing James's new book, Angels Against the Sun, a World War II saga of grunts, grit and brotherhood. Welcome back, James. Nice to see you again. Um, so we're going to be discussing the 11th Airborne Division. The well-known airborne units of World War II are the 82nd and the 101st, which were active in the European theatre. Did, did the 11th Airborne Division come about at the same time? Where is it created on the timeline of airborne units? It was formed in February of 43, of course, at which time the 82nd had already been formed, the 101st. Uh, I don't know what their formation date was, but I'm, I suspect that it was right around that same period as well, because they were all kind of fighting for the same cadre of guys, right? I mean, they kept like taking... Um, units expanding them and then splitting them up to go form cadres at other units and expand expansion. So it, the 11th was right in there. From a training perspective, are they all doing the same thing or does the 82nd and 101st know they're going to Europe and the 11th might be going somewhere else? Or you know, do they have any inkling on what where, where they're training for? Because obviously they're two very different theatres. Yes. Yeah, so the short answer to that question is no. The 11th had, had did not know where they were going. Um, when they arrived at Camp Polk in Louisiana, immediately the rumors started that they were destined for the Pacific because of all the swamps in the area that they were training in. But as soon as they got there, another unit that was already at Camp Polk left for Europe. So that kind of dashed their initial thoughts that they were going to the Pacific. And it wasn't really until February of 44 when they were all boarding trains leaving Camp Polk, Louisiana, and that train turned left, meaning it went west, that they figured out that they were now on their way to the Pacific. I love the idea that this, they, 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 they potentially believe that there's somebody in the upper echelons thinks that you need to send people to train in swamplands. That clearly means we're going to the jungle, <laughs> rather than it just being a cha- training ground that we just ship them to. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Yeah, they they were definitely overthinking that one. <laughs> well, I guess you know it's the probably on the tip of everybody's tongue. Where we're going to be, where, the excitement, where we're going to be sent. Joseph um, Joseph Swing is commander of the Eleventh Airborne. Who who is he? Um, it's always interesting because a lot of these airborne commanders are not necessarily from. Well, airborne's new, so you know what's their background to have found them for themselves for them to have found themselves in charge of an airborne unit. Yeah, it's a great question because to to your point, I mean the you know. America started with the first organized unit of parachutists, uh, the 501st Infantry Battalion. Now, obviously, those were a lot more junior officers at the time. It was battalion size, so you had a, a major in charge of that. But Swing Swing graduated from West Point as an artillery officer in 1915. And his first assignment out of West Point was with uh, General Black Jack Pershing's expedition into Mexico sometimes called the, the, the punitive expedition. Uh, basically, it was to chase down Pancho Villa and his, and his band of guerrillas that were launching incursions along the Mexico-Texas border. Um, but what's interesting about that campaign and how I really think, it, it, and, and why I went that far back to answer your question, was that it was the first time the U.S. Army had started experimenting with mechanization. And so there was this idea of, uh, it was the first time they used biplanes, to scout ahead of ground forces. They had started using armored vehicles, armored cars, and cargo trucks to move troops 
faster than the horses could move them. Um, they started using uh, wireless telegraph, you know, radios, sending Morse code for the first time. And so Swing at a very early part in his career was witness to kind of these innovations and learning to do things in the field that they really hadn't written doctrine around yet, right? Nobody knew how to incorporate armored cars or trucks into their into their tactics or what to do with these airplanes. And I think just as importantly of him witnessing these, these innovations was him also witnessing all the poor planning that happened simultaneous with the army trying to figure out how to use, how to use trucks, right? They, they ran out of spare parts. They didn't have enough gas. Sometimes uh, the planes wouldn't start. And so it became a, just as valuable from, from the cautionary tales, if you will, um, that swing learned from that example, I think, as he then went, you know, up the chain of command and in, 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 through his promotion um, into World War One, and then between the wars, when war broke out for the United States during Pearl Harbor, Swing was actually the uh, division commander for the 82nd Infantry Division's artillery. So he was he was a um, brigadier general, one star general in charge of the division artillery that was still horse drawn at that time. And so he was there when the division started transitioning into what we all now know as the 82nd Airborne Division. And so Ridgeway came in, took command after Omar Bradley left. Uh, Swing actually went with Ridgeway to uh, the gentleman's course for jump school where they made their one jump uh, at Fort Benning to, to earn their wings. And so he was very new to the airborne concept, but had had this exposure to innovation. And I think that the idea of airborne warfare appealed to him from that perspective, especially probably as a World War I veteran, the idea of vertical envelopment, fast moving warfare was definitely counter to his experiences as an artillery officer in World War I. And so I think he kind of came into it eyes wide open, but with a very conventional mindset. I think some of the differences of those young guys that came up through the parachute units as they were expanding had a very hardcore, very elite mindset around being parachutists, whereas Swing viewed it very much as a, a commute. This is, this is how we get to work, and everything else after we get to work is going to be very much like a conventional military unit, army unit. All right, so he'd been an, advi- he'd been an advisor to uh, Ike for uh, Husky. Yeah, so he did travel um from the United States during during the time that the 11th Airborne was standing up and going through training. And he did work with Eisenhower's staff as part of the invasion of Sicily, specifically around the airborne component of that. He and Eisenhower had known each other since before the war. And that was another important kind of uh, lesson learned that he brought back from the uh, drop into Sicily, which was, you know, a near disaster, depending on on how, how who you ask. But when he came back, he he put a whole new emphasis on night training for the 11th Airborne. So obviously the invasion of Sicily had taken place at night, night drops, night assembly problems, um, night marches. These were all things that he added. He extended the division's work week to include more hours of, of training after the sunset. He trained specifically, specifically for combat in the Pacific. Do they, they're shipped to New Guinea first, I think, aren't they? Is that where Swing has them doing jungle training or do they, I mean, are they expected to be used as sort of jungle trained troops or are they expecting sort of coop them in, swing in, capture a bridge or, you know, do they have any inclination of how they might be used? Um, so again, I think th- the short answer to that is no, but I, you know, because again, the, the, the airborne divisions were were almost half as big as a, a regular infantry division. So a regular infantry division had anywhere between fourteen or fifteen thousand men in it. A regular airborne division, swings in particular, had had eighty five hundred men in it. So they were a lot smaller than 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 their bigger units. When they got to New Guinea, though, to your point, they did embark on a, a series of very rigorous training exercises, and they had the benefit of being trained. Uh, some of them went to Australian run jungle schools, survival schools, and things like that. And they also started a series of live fire exercises. So they started doing some combined exercises, bringing in uh, their pack howitzers, bringing in their, their medical teams, their infantry and engineers, and kind of doing combined combat team exercises, if you will, live fires. And, 
And we we know that those live fire exercises were were pretty realistic because unfortunately several guys were killed during the exercises. They were shot um, or or you know mortally wounded by artillery fire that was very close and things like that. So they did have that benefit of that time of spending several months on New Guinea before they were committed into combat to refine their skills. And I think that's where they kind of understood that okay, we're not going to be used as the the shock troops that Doctrine had kind of called for. Most likely we're going to um, be using a more traditional ground role. But there were also a lot of rumors going around through the division conflicting with that, that they actually weren't going to see any combat until they were dropped into Japan proper, closer towards the end of the war. And so there was that there was that constant tension in the division around, well, they're going to use us for this, they're going to use us for that, or they're not going to use us at all until we invade the, the home island their first sea combat on late don't, don't they but it's hardly they're not leading the charge they arrived 30 days after the initial landings had been made and they are expected at this point just to fight as a regular infantry division aren't they they're they're replacing them with the seventh infantry division that's right yeah so the the invasion of late occurred um in october of 1944 the 11th Airborne, much to their disgruntlement, sat that one out. Um, and that, again, goes back to that size issue, right? So MacArthur and his ground commander, Walter Kruger, really viewed the small size of the Airborne Division to their detriment, meaning that they, you know, a lot of the logistical support capabilities organic to a normal division had been stripped away from the 11th because, again, they were the doctrine was they would be dropped in and then pulled out and then dropped, you know, and reconstituted more frequently. So they didn't have these logistical support units that a lot of the other divisions met. Well, when you're island hopping, logistics is really, really crucial because sometimes those supply chains starts all the way back in San Francisco. And so planning how you're going to supply these guys becomes critical. And so because they weren't, they were viewed as being unable to sustain themselves in combat, they landed to your point later in the campaign, but higher than expected casualty rates meant that they were going to be committed into combat They were um, given the initial mission of setting up blocking positions in the central mountain range of Leyte to relieve the 7th Infantry Division so that they could then pull back and swing around um, the southern portion of the island. At at the time, the Japanese were landing thousands of reinforcements on the west coast of the island and were, generally speaking, protected by this mountain range. And so MacArthur wanted to pull his units that were already there to attack the West Coast, both from the north side and the south, because you couldn't really get much over those mountains, right? They're extremely rugged. I think the peaks, you know, spiked up to 3,000 feet, extremely rugged. Um, No roads or, you know, trails navigable by a Jeep even were were going up that direction. But he does, Swing does actually manage to get an airdrop in, doesn't he, to move his front line forward. I mean, the hazard is, hazard is enough in Europe. I've already mentioned, you know, Husky, was it, you know, a disaster, you know, waited to happen. But you know, how is it? How, oh, the, the, the odd thing about talking about the jungle and airborne is you're always sort of haunted by ideas of Vietnam and helicopters coming in between trees. So you think about, which is what, 30 years later, 20 years later, you think about parachutists coming in in any number and you just think of jungle. So how... And how the hell, how how could that possibly work? By you know, how does the airborne drop go for swing? As he's what's he trying to achieve? He's trying to is he trying to just move the front line forward? Is was that his plan? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great point of comparison when you bring up the European version of airborne operations, where you know we're all familiar with Normandy and Market Garden, etc. You know, where their airborne was you you know the airborne capability I should say was used almost like kicking in the door right to. to to seize these objectives where swing, I think, again, with that unique perspective of, of innovation and convention, if you will, um, used his airborne capability in, in a very unique way to, to move his, his objectives forward. Right. And so the way that looked on Leyte was initially the 511th parachute infantry was on point. They were the guys kind of marching up into the mountains very quickly. It became obvious that, they the further they went into the mountains, the more difficult it was to keep them supplied. Everything more or less had to be man packed in on people's backs. So you're carrying mortar shells, you know, all your food rations, crates, medical supplies, and everything. Well, once they got far enough in and they found a relatively flat plateau area, those initial units started chopping down some trees to make for a small 
clearing a small drop zone there so that they could then start flying in and airdropping those supplies further inland. And so what happened there is, is that Swing then seized upon this idea of a forward base as a forward drop zone area. And the only aircraft he had available to him at the time were these single engine artillery observation planes, um, you know, very small two seater aircraft. And so what he did was he, he airdropped in a platoon of combat engineers one man at a time from these these aerial observation planes. And these guys were literally taking the static lines of their parachutes, wrapping them around the spars of the seat of the airplane, and then throwing themselves out as this thing puttered, puttered over the jungle. And so to your point, once once these engineers got on the ground, you know, 30 some out of these engineers, they started using their demolitions and their tools to widen and increase the size of that drop zone. So now you have a slightly bigger drop zone out in the middle of the jungle, but you've still got your infantry there that was on point on perimeter security protecting this drop zone because, of course, the surrounding mountains are are, are filled with Japanese patrols trying to make their way over to the East Coast. So then Swing continues to further build out that forward base by, again, one at a time, dropping in a company of his glider infantry troops. So again, he's one of the things he did back before they left the States and even in New Guinea, he was running his own division level um, jump schools. Instead of the guys going to Fort Benning for three or four weeks worth of training, he ran a five-day jump course uh, at Camp Polk in Louisiana, and then again, a five-day jump course um, in New Guinea. And so at one point, he had um, 75% of the enlisted men in the division were, were jump qualified. And so that gave him this flexibility of where he could say, okay, well, all my all my school trained paratroopers are, you know, in the mountains protecting this drop zone. I've got the flexibility, though, to drop in some of my glider troops that are airborne qualified, jump qualified. And so that he, again, flew them in one at a time. I mean, I don't know, 300 some odd sorties to get, you know, to get a company in there, something like that. And so those guys then secured the drop zone, which then allowed the original, you know, the 511th to continue to push their way up and in, up into the mountains. And and Swing had even gone so far as as an, as an attempt to raise internal morale for the division, change the name of the glider infantry units to paraglider infantry units to kind of represent the fact that they were both qualified in in parachuting and in um, glider operations. Now this is all well and good when you have uh, airfields to resupply them, but the Japanese counterattack was was been well behind the 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 lines. Uh, Swing's airfields. I mean, was that a big surprise for Swing? Did he have enough to hold the airfields that he was using for his resupply missions? Great question. Yeah. So, so Swing's airfields were back kind of on the east coast, just a little bit further inland, and the rains had really turned them into these quagmires of of uh, you know mud fields. And the reason that Swing got an airfield for his own division was because nobody else wanted to use them, so you couldn't really land P-38s or any of the of the of the support aircraft on them because they were just sinking into the mud, but they were perfect for Swing's light observation aircraft, right? These small aircraft. So Swing did have a couple of airfields that he could use for this resupply operation. The the counterattack you're you're speaking of was this idea that the Japanese high command that was based in Manila at the time, so on a on a different island. They wanted to delay as long as possible MacArthur getting air uh, ground-based aircraft, right? So the Japanese were afraid that once the Americans had established air superiority from air bases on Leyte, that, you know, it would make their invasion of Luzon, the main island, all that easier. So they came up with this, this strategy of that they were going to send several thousand Japanese overland over those mountains to come down into Leyte Valley to seize those airfields in concert with a Japanese airdrop um, onto those airfields. So the idea was, is that these two units, you know, not too dissimilar to allied missions, right? They're going to drop paratroopers in to seize the airfields while the ground guys come in to reinforce them. Things did not quite go according to plan for the Japanese on that. The first, the first issue was, is that they weren't expecting Americans to be in the mountains. And so those several thousand guys that were coming over the mountains uh, were whittled down by the 11th Airborne troops that were in the mountains. So only about 700 of them actually made it to the other side of the mountains. They were 
pretty scattered, not very well supplied, not heavily armed. The Japanese airborne troops that took off from Manila um, dropped about 300 parachutists onto the airfields. Several of the planes that were shot down on their way in. Um, and this did catch them by surprise. Now, there had been some warnings, you know, some speculation, if you will, in intelligence reports that this was a capability that the Japanese had. There certainly were guerrilla units on Luzon who might have spotted the marshalling of aircraft, but nobody really took the threat all that seriously. And so to answer your question, um, they did not have a lot of guys guarding those airfields. Most of the infantry had either been moving their way up into the mountains as part of that that chain of forward bases that they were trying to create across the island, or were further out on the flanks of those mountains trying to set up blocking positions. So he did have some glider infantry that were sitting around the airfield waiting to jump into the forward base. And so they happened to be there and they launched a counterattack. And then they also temporarily attached another infantry regiment that had just landed on the beach. They temporarily attached them to Swing's command to assist in counterattacking against those Japanese paratroopers. It's, it's slightly way he comes unstuck, really. He, he just doesn't quite have enough troops to do everything he's doing. It's, the, it's, where, it's where you have the idea of the front line breaking down when they, when they could pop up anywhere. Yeah, that's right. And they, they ended up burning, they ended up ransacking almost all of his observation planes. So I think at that point he had like 14 of them mustered on the airfield. I think all of them except one were destroyed, which meant that while Swing was then not only dealing with re-seizing these airfields that were under Japanese control, he didn't have access to his aircraft. He was scrambling to get other aircraft. The guys up in the mountains went five days without getting any food. You know, that just shows you how tenuous that supply line was, was that, you know, it was almost on an on-demand kind of thing for, you know, the, the food would land and it would be eaten kind of thing. They didn't have a lot of stockpiles up there. Yeah, it's a ter- terribly modern way of fighting, is it? Drop them in, resupply them. Don't worry about necessarily the land bridge. If you get the comms work to work you could just radio back what you need and they'll bring it apart from when all your planes have been destroyed and it all falls to pieces does he quickly get uh more planes i mean because the pacific's one of those strange theaters it's not as if it's all on demand sat there in england that can be brought over everything's been shipped in yeah that's right well he had he had lots of supplies sitting on the beach so it wasn't necessarily a question of 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 that it was the question was more how do you get it off the beach and up into where it needs to go you know, so the first step was was once they were able to kind of reestablish that supply line and get the supplies to that forward base, the trouble then became that that was a plateau. And, and again, as they continued to push their way west, they went higher up into the mountains to where the cloud cover was almost just consistently there all the time. And so those planes would only be able to drop the supplies to the first base. They could never find a break in the clouds, or very rarely, I should say, be able to find a break in the clouds to drop it to the most forward troops. So then the trouble you had was you then had to man pack it from that first plateau up into the mountains. And those patrols routinely bumped into Japanese patrols. Um, There was only really one trail that they were using. And so there was a lot of ambushing and counter ambushing and, and a lot of disruption in that supply line as the Japanese would would cut that trail off periodically. At one point, they actually occupied a hill that the guys had to then couldn't take the trail over the hill. They had to go around the hill, which added more delay. And it's and it's really hard to overstate how rugged that terrain was. I mean, uh, one one of the veterans talked about how he could literally stand there and put his hand out in front of him and touch the side of the mountain. I mean, that's how steep it was that these guys were trying to climb climb up with all of this, uh, you know, an 81 millimeter mortar shell is not a lightweight thing. And is it a two-way process? I mean, if you're, if you're injured, do they ever get landing strips to get people out or do you have to be then carried all the way back to the beach? So the short answer is, is, is that you had to be carried back at a minimum to that plateau. And so the way, and so what happened was, is in addition to dropping those guys in one at a time that I mentioned, they also decided to drop in some surgeons. So they had some surgeons who had joined the unit in New Guinea, who had the benefit of going through that division level jump school. And so they dropped in two surgical teams into that that plateau who were able to set up an aid station there. 
So then it just became a question of if you were if you were badly injured up in the front, up in the up in the mountains, you know, they would triage you there, do the best they could to get you uh, stable enough for that trek back to the plateau, because that certainly was uh, not an easy maneuver. I want to say that I, I may get the numbers wrong, but it was something like it took them eight to 10 hours to carry a guy on a stretcher from the mountains to the plateau and then an hour and a half to walk back. So it, so it shows you just how carrying something, you know, carrying a guy on a stretcher like that, just how much burden it added to that. But if you could get to the plateau where the surgeons were, they at some point extended that to where they could land those light observation planes on that plateau. And for the more seriously wounded, they would then fly them out to more robust medical facilities on the coast. Uh, they're there for 30 days. What ship are they in when they leave? How, are they judged to have done a good job? Yeah, so they were in pretty bad shape when they came out of the mountains. So they, to your point, it took them about 30 days, a little bit more to get all the way across the island. They emerged on the West Coast around, uh, or on Christmas Day, I should say. Um, those guys that had been up in the mountains since the beginning were were pretty emaciated. A lot of them had had, had lost a lot of weight due to the not not eating a lot. And of course, you know, you're hiking up and down those mountains, you're burning a lot of calories. They've been basically drenched by the rain for the entire time they're there. So they've been soaking wet. Their uniforms have been rotting off of them because of course, when your supply chain is that tenuous, you're prioritizing beans and bullets, not extra uniforms and things like that. Several of the guys had had to, you know, their their jump boots had rotted away. And so they were taking boots from the dead uh, one guy had actually taken taken boots from a dead guy and had to cut the toes off of the boots so that he could fit inside of them. So they they were pretty bedraggled, which resulted in some controversy because as the 511th was making their way down to link up with the 7th Infantry that was on the far coast, Swing ordered them to halt their advance so that he could then push a glider infantry unit through to the coast. And a lot of the guys in the 511th resented that. They thought that, well, because they look so bedraggled and so horrible, that Swing didn't want them to be the first troops of his scene coming out of the jungle. I have to say, you mentioned boots there. What surprised me is boots don't last long in the jungle, do they? These guys, whoa, it's phenomenal. They're asking for more boots. We need more boots. They're just falling off their feet. Yeah, falling off their feet. And, you know, you see a lot of pictures from, from the campaign and guys have cut their pants off into shorts or they're, you know, they're not wearing shirts. It's very much, uh, uh, you know, you really get a sense of the humidity and the, and the, just the rotting away of, of their uniforms. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. Joining me is James Fenlon and we're discussing the US 11th Airborne Division. They're used again on Luzon for Operation Shoestring. That Now that is a more of that sort of traditional kicking the door open maneuver, isn't it? When they drop, there's quite a lot of them. That's right. So in late January of 45, the campaign in Luzon is going on. MacArthur has landed troops to the north of Manila. Of course, Manila is the capital city of the Philippines. It was um, had a population of just under a million. So it was, it was a large, you know, a large capital city. It had um, government buildings that rival those in Washington, D.C. It was before the war. It was known as the Pearl of the Orient. And MacArthur had really wanted to liberate Manila as a, you know, as a significant allied milestone up there with like Paris. You know, it was it was it was a a marquee event that he wanted to have happen. It wasn't happening fast enough. And so he again leaned in and decided to create a secondary several secondary uh, landings further south of Manila. One of those was um, with Eichelberger's 8th Army, which is basically the 11th Airborne Division. Swing had advocated to land uh, the or airdrop the entire division in that more traditional kind of airborne role, but they just didn't have the aircraft. And so what they ended up doing was uh, amphibiously landing the glider infantry and then airdropping the 511th uh, Parachute Regiment further inland so that you had the glider guys coming in on the beach south of Manila, pushing their way east inland when it was fairly confident that they had broken through uh, the Japanese resistance on that ridge line leading up to the drop zone. They greenlit the drop and the 511th landed on the top of that ridge line to then start punching their way north to Manila. It's interesting that they they don't leave it to chance. You know, it's not 
Arnhem where for so many days later we'll be there. It's like, no, we've punched through. We, we know we can get there. Now we'll drop you in. They're not leaving them there with a sort of uh, ass in the air and, and hope. Yeah, that's right. And it was interesting because that that mandate started with MacArthur, who was was in support of this operation, which they had they had euphemistically called a reconnaissance in force what was going to be taken advantage of fully to get into Manila. But it, it it had come back, you know, and everybody agreed, but it was it was mandated that, hey, you can't drop these guys out here unless there's a high degree of confidence that you're going to be able to link up and support them. Because, of course, the Japanese at this point were, you know, well-known or infamous for their ability to counterattack. And um, it wasn't exactly sure how many uh, Japanese were in that area. This is a big parachute drop. You know, they're notorious in Europe for being dropped here, there, and everywhere. How does it go? Because this is a 1,600 troops being dropped in. How does it go with this mass drop? It go according to plan? You know, it took them three lifts. So they had, again, due to the limited number of aircraft, they had three lifts. So it took them a day and a half. They did two lifts on one day and then a third the next morning. They did have an issue with a cloud bank that was kind of rolling up the ridge line. And so the first couple of passes landed straight on the drop zone. The following guys dropped short of the drop zone. And then the second lift came in and saw the parachutes from the guys that had missed dropped on the first lift. And so they started dropping short as well. Having said that, in my opinion, it sounds worse than it actually was. They all landed on top of the ridge line. They all landed pretty close to the drop zone. And some of them, as a matter of fact, because they dropped short, actually landed closer to their objectives. The initial objectives were merely just basically securing that that drop zone area by seizing road intersections and things like that. Is that essentially what they're doing? They're seizing a lump of land to act as another jump off point for the next part of the advance. That's right. That's right. Well, and it was, you know, Swing referred to it, you know, again, he was advocating for the whole division to drop. That didn't happen. He kind of referred to it as half a loaf is better than none. The other flip side of that was, is they didn't have enough uh, ships to land the full division at one time either. So, you know, because of all that stuff was was focused further north, helping with the main landing, it was kind of this idea of like, well, we can land these two regiments amphibiously, and then we have this unique capability of being able to drop these guys. So that actually saves us the hassle of having to scramble for more ships. So we'll drop these guys in, and then we'll we'll use them to push north. So they're, they're still 20 miles short of Manila. Didn't make wonder why they hadn't just dropped a bit close to the Manila, because they now, they have no other way of getting there they have no do they have any it, 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 it just i was say shanks is pony but that's probably not an americanism um so they, there's no other way to walk is there do they have lorries attached or trucks attached or they did land some trucks um on the beach so they landed on the west coast and then they ba- imagine it is an, an l shape basically they pushed in from the beach and then went straight up into Manila. They did bring in um, some trucks from that amphibious landing. Not very many. They it brought in some deuce and a half cargo trucks and some jeeps. Um, a lot of the vehicles, though, were stuck out in the in the surf because they had there was a sandbar that they had not caught, and so some of the some of the landing craft got hung up on that sandbar short of the actual beach landing. So there was a, a some logistical challenges of getting those things out of the surf and up onto the road. And so what they ended up started doing was they started shuttling units forward. So they would load as many guys as they could. And I think it was 12 cargo trucks. They would drive them forward until they made contact with the Japanese. The guys would jump out of the trucks. The trucks would then turn around and drive back to get the next group that had started marching. And in this way, they kind of just started shuttling guys forward. And it kind of became this, um, I was about to say informal race for Manila, but in many ways it was a formal race for Manila because Eichelberger and Swing very much wanted to beat um, MacArthur's first cav, cavalry division, which was coming in from the north into Manila. And so the offensive into Manila was very characterized by Swing and Eichelberger, both being very much up front in the forward lines, urging the men on to move into Manila, which they did. They did a you know a number of these um, things where they would pin the Japanese down, and then the guys would keep moving up until they got into the southern city limits of Manila, where they kind of were stopped cold by the Japanese defenses there. Well, so that's the, it's the Genko line, isn't it? My my in my mind, the uh, airborne are kind of light uh, the light infantry. At which point you're hitting uh, fixed defenses. I mean, what? 
how formidable was the Genko line that they're expected to uh, get through? Yeah, so do you, I, I, I agree with you. I think light infantry is a great way to kind of characterize the 11th in their in their campaign. Um, so the the defenses along the Genko line were reinforced machine gun bunkers, and imagine these almost like uh, you know beehive shaped concrete or you know brick structures that had been there for quite a while reinforced with the Japanese had brought in um, anti-aircraft guns that were leveled into ground use. They had also reinforced parts of the line with naval guns that they had recovered from um, ships that were sunk in, in Manila Bay. And so it was, it was, it was pretty formidable. And then, and, and it was, it was basically infantry 101, right? Where it was fire and maneuver using smoke grenades to to provide concealment as they bound forward to try to tackle these machine guns one at a time. Urban fighting is attritional, and you're trying to knock these things out one at a, on a, one at a time. They're strung out over an extended, what is it, 50-mile supply route. And the criticism right at the start was this isn't a, 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 a regular-sized army division. Do they have enough reserves to feed in on this uh, for this urban fighting in Manila? Or do they are they just being... <laughs> Obliterated, that's maybe not the word. What, 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 annihilated? That's not, decimated was probably the word I was trying to think. I was thinking of Romans and legions being decimated. Yeah, it's a great question. And and again, I think this is another interesting, uh, at least I found it an interesting component to the campaign was what really saved the 11th in that example of their long supply line was two things. One, it was swings, insistence that everybody in the division be a contributing factor. So by what, you know, recognizing before they had left the States, the limitations of their sizes, he had, by way of example, trained all the members of the division band, knew how to do aerial resupply, carrying in supplies on Luzon from the beachhead. The finance team was responsible for bringing up our artillery shells. So he had all hands on deck, so to speak, to support this literally in the division. And then, but the other big force multiplier was the use of Filipino guerrillas. And so when the division landed, these, these guerrilla units flocked down, you know, to support them and swing used them to guard that supply line. And that freed up his glider infantry units to again, swing around on the flank to create a pretty broad front with which to attack into Manila. Considering I hadn't realized they'd done any drops in the Pacific. And we're now onto the third, they have a, a third drop, don't they? Where they're, uh, an action with the in coordination with the guerrillas. This this time it's a rescue mission, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So when the Japanese seized the Philippines in 1942, they, they you know they captured thousands of um, civilians, right? And by civilians, I mean Americans, British, French civilians who were working on the island who were who were unable to escape when the invasion took place. Well, the Japanese put them all in internment camps, and several of them were in Manila. That were they were released when when the Americans pushed their way into Manila, but there was another one um, behind about twenty some odd miles behind Japanese lines at a place called Los Banos, and there were a little over two thousand civilians interned at a prison camp there. And MacArthur became concerned that as the campaign continued and the Japanese were going to fall back into other prepared fighting positions, that they might either kill, uh, that they might kill um, the prisoners rather than take them with them or just let them go. And so the 11th got tapped for a rescue mission. To your point, um, that that rescue mission started with a ground infiltration by the recon teams supported by Filipino guerrillas. Um, they initiated the ground assault at a time when the Japanese guards were um, all out in the morning doing their calisthenics. So there was very few there, you know, they were lightly armed on the perimeter of the camp, if you will. And of course, the camp was predominantly set up to keep people in, not keep people out. Um, they initiated that attack simultaneous to a company of parachute infantry jumping in near the camp as well to a, a little cleared area to the side of the camp. So those guys then landed and rushed in to join the attack on the camp. It was extremely successful. A couple of the of the prisoners were wounded, but none of them were killed. Two of the guerrillas were unfortunately killed, but none of the other attackers were killed in the attack. And then while all that was going on, several dozen amphibious tracked vehicles came up across a lake and clanked their way into the camp, loaded everybody, all the prisoners and all the paratroopers in, 
and evacuated them back across um, the lake. So it was really one of these uh, textbook operations. You couldn't really have asked for it to go any better than it did. And it was kind of a day in the life of the division because it was it was one company. Well, it was one battalion all told that that conducted the raid while the rest of the division was still fighting. And all the guys that were in the raid the next day were back on the front lines. It, it's it's a real feature film story, isn't it? Rescue the people, all goes well, a parachute drop, you've got Amtrak splashing through the water, you've got gorillas, you've got everything. Yeah, you even got a, a paratrooper who, after the war, married one of the girls that he rescued from the prison camp. So, yeah. The love story, guy gets the girl, it's all, it's all, it's all there. <laughs> That's really close to the end of the war that, at that point, isn't it? It's I can't quite remember the date, but it's not long after that the atomic bombs are dropped there. Yeah, well, so the, the raid occurred in February. So there was a couple, still some months of fighting on, on Luzon. It was a lot of, uh, you know, they were kind of pushing back around to the southeast to cut off the rest of the island. Um, and then rumors of the surrender started not long after the, the atomic bombs were dropped. I mean, I presume they were expecting to be dropped into... Uh, you already mentioned that it was sort of it was they'd been talked about. Had they actually done any serious planning for the eleventh to be dropped in? The the campaign in Luzon had had petered out to a certain extent. There was always still Japanese patrols and Japanese stragglers running around. That they were, you know, it was a, it was a viewed as a great way to integrate replacements into the division. They could take them out on patrols and 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 you know, fifty percent of the time, these patrols would actually get into skirmishes with Japanese units. So it was, you know, very much an on-the-job training type of uh, training regimen. I don't think that they had actually started getting into the men. Certainly, had not started getting into any of the planning for the invasion of Japan. Swing, and it was it was taken as a given that they were going to be airdropped into uh, the main island as part of Operation Olympic. It's, it's, there's, there's that liminal space, isn't there? The war's ended, it hasn't ended, and they're sent to Japan. Yeah, so this is where the division size finally comes into favor for them. So they're, you know, they're small, they're used to being moved by air, and so very rapidly they get this warning order to fly from Manila. They fly to Okinawa. Everybody's scrambling. They get to Okinawa, and then they sit there for several weeks while all of the details of the surrender are worked out, right? So the Japanese had indicated they're willing to discuss terms. They flew, a, you know, a delegation to Manila to discuss those terms. The 11th is then waiting on Okinawa for the word to go in. They finally get the word. They fly into a small airfield on the outskirts of Tokyo. They secure that airfield. Of course, all the guys going in, they're expecting that it's a trap. They didn't believe that the Japanese would actually surrender. And of course, this was, you know, the Japanese had made announcements that they were never going to surrender. So it wasn't, you know, it's not like they were making this up. They had plenty of evidence that to believe that the Japanese weren't going to give up. But when they landed, one of the troopers commented that the Japanese had surrendered as hard as they had fought. And so there was no there was no incidents. Nothing really, you know, happened, although they, again, they were fully armed. They had, you know, loaded machine guns, hand grenades, the whole, the whole bit. They secured that airfield with, uh, which is where MacArthur then eventually lands to then uh, go execute the final surrender document on the, the deck of the Missouri. That's a fantastic way to, to end the war for them, actually being sent in for the actual final, final, final uh, surrender. How long did they stay on Japan for after that, or are they pulled out quite quickly uh several years actually they were occupation troops for uh in japan now having said that most of the veterans started rotating back to the states with the point system i'm sure you're familiar with that um so as the point system kind of kicked in guys would would fly back to the states or ship back to the states probably is a better way to put it and then the replacements coming in um formed the occupation army, if you will, and they were moved further north up in the islands where their their first mission was disarming um, the populace. And then they kind of just settled in for traditional occupation duty. I said, what a remarkable, what a remarkable story. As I say, I, 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 the 82nd and the 101st have taken all the oxygen out of uh, airborne, everybody else's airborne operations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that's that's what inspired me to kind of write this write this book, just you know, kind of like the first one. There's so many interesting stories, and the more I got into it, I found out just how you know airborne of the airborne the eleventh was. It was really a unique way that they utilized their parachute capability to kind of supplement 
their ground capacity and really as you know as i say punch above their weight well good good stuff thank you james Loyal listener, if you want to read more about the 11th Airborne Division, the book to pick up is Angels Against the Sun, a World War II saga of grunts, grit and brotherhood. And if you want to hear more from James, go back to episode 112, where we discuss his book, Four Hours of Fury, looking at US airborne units during Operation Varsity. Please don't forget, if you have enjoyed this episode of the show, why not consider becoming a patron? You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2 podcast for patrons patreon will give you a custom rss feed to put into your podcast software of choice which you can use to get extra world war ii chat and free episodes magically appearing on your device so that's patreon.com slash ww2 podcast well that is all from me for now i'm angus wallace and thanks for listening Very 88 millimeter gun hit over time. Blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.